Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verses 31 to 39. If I could hang a title on my message tonight, it's going to be Safe and Secure. Safe and Secure. Let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for the word of God. We come to worship you in spirit and in truth with the singing that we've already done. Father, with the preaching that will happen. And Father, we just ask that it would be clear and it would exalt Christ. Father, meet the need of everyone here today. And Father, let your word not return to you void, but accomplish the purpose you have for us tonight. Father, we do remember our pastor and ask that you would administer to the Harmons as well as to the shepherds. Thank you for the good report of Abby and ask that you would just continually minister and heal. Father, we pray for not only them, but for many in our church family that are struggling, whether we're on the mountaintops of victory or in the valley of defeat. We just pray that, God, you would meet our needs. For, Father, you are a great God. And, Father, we love you and we thank you. And if there's one here that does not know you as their Savior, may tonight be the night of salvation for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of our message, Safe and Secure. Well, I was reading an article in preparation for this, and the title of the article is Nine of the World's Most Ridiculously Safe, excuse me, Secure Safes and Vaults. Now, I don't have time to go through all nine of them, but let me give you the top three. You probably guessed number one, but let me go through, you, uh, go through them with you anyway. The first of all, the first one that is the ridiculously secure and safe, safes and vaults, is Cheyenne Mountain. Cheyenne Mountain redefines the phrase job security. Employees work behind two 25-ton doors, which can withstand a 30-megaton blast. To put it in perspective, Fat Man, the bomb dropped on Nagasaki, would have to explode 1,429 times to crack the entrance. The office there are buried 2,000 feet into the mountain's granite, so far that the air has to be pumped inside. That air, however, is the cleanest in the world. It is pro processed by a state-of-the-art system of chemical, biological, and nuclear filters. It's no wonder why Cheyenne hosted the U.S. Military Warning Center and NORAD during the Cold War. The second most is Salavad Global Seed Vault. If Armageddon happens soon, any hope of bringing the world's crops back is buried 390 feet under a Nordic mountain. The Savalabar Global Seed Vault on the island of Spitzenberg currently houses over 500,000 of the world's plant species. The vault is 200, or excuse me, 620 miles south of the North Pole and safeguarded by hundreds of miles of ocean, plus a couple of thousand polar bears. It's so deep, it's, resistance, it's resistant to nuclear holocaust, not to mention severe earthquake. It also sits 430 feet above sea level, safe from any possible sea level rise. The three seed vault lay behind four heavy steel doors. As long as the keys aren't hidden under a doormat, our seeds should be safe till doomsday. And then the number one secure facility is Fort Knox. Plan, plan on breaking into Fort Knox, maybe? Well, first climb the four surrounding fences, two of which are electrified and then sneak past the armed sentinels lining the perimeter. Be sure to avoid the video cameras. Don't waste time trying to blast through the granite walls. They're four feet thick, held together by 750 tons of reinforced steel. If you get past the armed guards inside, plus the maze of locked doors, you'll probably be stopped by the 22-ton vault door. Don't despair. The vault can be opened but only if you find all the staff members who know a small slice of the combination. You'll need them, all of them, since nobody knows the whole thing. Once you get inside the vault, you'll have to break into a smaller vault tucked inside. Then you can start taking the 5,000 tons of gold bullion stored in there. And do be careful when you leave, because there's 30,000 soldiers from Fort Knox military camp, and they'll be anxiously awaiting outside for you. These three facilities are pretty secure, but they pale in comparison to the security of our salvation. 
Paul begins to encourage the Roman believers of the security they have in Christ. We can never lose what we never earn. Our salvation is based on Christ and his finished work at Calvary, not on our good works or something we earned. As we dive into this great book of Romans, let's just be reminded of a couple of things. And first of all, it was penned by Paul under the inspiration of God while in Corinth in about 57 AD. He was on his third missionary journey. And although there's no mention of Paul visiting Rome of himself, but would later be taken there in chains to testify, some by course, some by force. The Gospel of Romans was a preparatory letter before a plan stop Paul was going to make later on. The letter was delivered by a wonderful servant, Phoebe, a highly favored co-laborer of Paul. As it says in Romans 16, 1 and 2, I commend you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is a sensoria, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and ye assist her in whatever business she hath need of. For she hath been a secure of many, and of myself also. There's also the reminder, remember, Paul was a Roman by birth, and also a native of Tarsus in Sicily. His Hebrew name was Saul, but later, after Acts chapter 9, was again changed to, or excuse me, it was Saul, but it was changed to Paul, which means little. How did he view himself? Humbly. 1 Timothy 1.15, the chiefest of sinners, that's what he called himself. Also, the least of the apostles. 1 Corinthians 15.9 says, for I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. As we see Paul, we also see the people or his audience that he's addressing. It was a mixed group of both Jews and Gentile believers. And the church had neither Peter as his foundational leader or Paul. So many speculated that in Acts chapter 2, after Paul, Peter had preached that glorious message and thousands had gotten saved, that they returned to Rome. And began meeting together in a church. We see this in Acts chapter 2. For it's mentioned the strangers of Rome. But then also Philippians 4.22 says. And, and Paul we know his preaching ministry. Wherever he went he was preaching the gospel. We should all be salt and light. No matter where we go. No matter where we're at. In season. Out of season. And he was like that. It says, Philippians 4.22, all the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. So we see his, we see who penned it, we see the people, and now the purpose. Can't we all just get along? That's what was going on at the Church of Rome. Whenever you get different groups of people together, there can be conflict. And in Romans chapter 15, verse 5 and 6, it, it really reveals the purpose now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one towards another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and with one mouth glorify God, even the, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so really bringing together, the one thing that I really enjoy here at Grace is our unity. Our love for one another, but also our love for God. And that, that reveals itself. To really construct the foundation of our faith, Paul begins to use this letter, and this letter is used by God to really bring about foundational faith thinking. To share with believers in Rome and with the world the great fundamental truth of Christianity, and that is justification by faith. It also explains one of the greatest mysteries of Habakkuk 2.4, which is the just shall live by faith. For we find this repeated in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. We also see it in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. And also found in Hebrews 10, 38. God wants to get this point across. The just shall live by faith. It's not of us, but is of God. And then as we look not only the purpose, but the parts, we see, number one, God's righteousness and salvation in chapters 1 and 8. We see also God's righteousness in Israel in chapters 9 to 11. And then also God's righteousness and practical Christian living in chapter 12, verse 16. Or excuse me, in chapter 12 to chapter 16. 
Last time I was with you, we talked about chapter 12 and the practicality of our sacrificial living before the Lord. And now we look at chapter 8, and we begin to camp on this verse. And in chapter 8, verse 1, we begin with that glorious verse. But before we can get there, let's whet our appetite. Let's go back a little bit, and let's look at Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Because Romans chapter 8, verse 1 is the answer to Romans chapter 7. 7 verse 24. We already know in the beginning of Romans it talks about how sinful we are. We are very sinful. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For there's none righteous, no, not one. This is the word of God speaking. You know, the world tells us that we're great and everything's all right. We're self-sufficient. We're heroes. I like that shirt I saw a teenager wearing recently, or actually it was an adult wearing it recently. And it had Jesus right in the center. And it had all these heroes around him. And he said, let me tell you how I saved the world. Jesus is the greatest hero of all. And we see this in chapter 7, verse 24. Paul laments, he said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then in gloriously, chapter 8, verse 1. It's so exciting. There is therefore now no condemnation, freedom to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Oh, the germination truth of that verse. You know, it's almost, it reminds me of going on a long journey. You know how you're going on a long journey and you've got to get somewhere. You've got to, you've got, you've you've got to be somewhere at a certain time. And all of a sudden you hit a traffic jam. That's like chapter 6 and 7 of Romans. It's, it's, I do the things I don't want to do, and I don't do the things that I do want to do. And uh, Paul's talking about this struggle. It's almost like in that traffic jam. You're going back and forth. Uh, frustrating. Oh, wretched man that I am. And then you know when you get to that clearing. And you get to that clearing, and you got the road in front of you, and you hit the accelerator. Staying in the speed limit, of course. And you hit that accelerator and you're like, woo! And there's no cars around you. You're like, I'm free. I think that's kind of the expression Paul had here. No condemnation to them, look at this, to them that are in Christ Jesus. In. Can I ask you, are you in or are you out? Are you going uptown or downtown? Do you... Have you come to a place where you've see, received Christ as your Savior? Oh, my friend, I hope you have. Taste and see that the Lord is good. No other name given among men whereby you must be saved. He who began a good work on you will be faithful to complete it into the day of Jesus Christ. Oh, my friend, trust Jesus as your Savior. Because it's jailbreak joy. It's freedom to live righteously. And the Spirit of God that dwells within you is prompting you. As it says, who walk as a result of our salvation. We not walk not after the flesh. We walk after the Spirit of God. That's the goal. That's the gate. That's the focus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Forgetting those things which are behind. Focusing on what is before. Sometimes we can get wrapped up in the past. And so Paul, he begins to share this. And as we go through chapter 8, especially looking in the latter part of that, we see, we find four reasons our salvation is secure. Four reasons our salvation is secure. Looking at Romans chapter 8. Verse 31, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Verse 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Who shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 
For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor anything present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's four truths I want to show you that I think this verse brings out. And the first one is, it is secure, and I'm speaking about our salvation. It is secure from corrupt counselors. Verse 31 says, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? It's really a double question to bring us to the same conclusion. After Paul had already reminded us of who is in sovereign control of all things, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 which says, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. We know that Joseph, if you remember at the end of his life, after his dad died, the brothers got a little nervous. The brothers came to him and said, surely he will want to exact his revenge on us for all that we did to him before. Do you remember what Joseph said? Talk about a perspective. Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. How could Joseph say that? He's just a man, just like you and me. What an incredible perspective. And that's because Joseph sovereignly knew who was in control of all things. Listen to what the psalmist says in 27.1. The Lord is the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. We're talking about the God who created ex nihilo, something out of nothing. That's a powerful God. We're talking about the God who led the nation of Israel into a kill box with the Pharaoh's armies bearing down on them. And as Moses stood forth and said, what? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And what happened? Oh, my friend, have you ever you ever been in a situation that seemed hopeless? You ever seen, been in a situation that just didn't make sense? But God. And God gloriously allowed you to go through it. And he was there with you, taking you over, under, through it. Because he's God. But it says at the end of that verse, if God be for us, who can be against us? So let's talk about some of those that can be against us. First of all, there's someone with false doctrine that can be against you. Anyone that exalts self and says you have a part in your salvation. Paul was combating the religious elite at the time, which exalted the law and the obedience to the law. The whole book of Galatians is a letter reminding us of our righteousness. It's not because of strict adherence to the law or because of circumcision, but because of the grace of God. Paul and others had to address this in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem council when it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Have you ever had someone that said, Jesus and... That's a problem, my friend. I had a well-meaning young lady at the Inner Harbor a couple of years back that said I wasn't saved because I wasn't speaking in tongues. I said, no, no, my friend. You see, Colossians chapter 2 says, verse 10, I am complete in Christ, lacking nothing. I'm complete in Christ. Be very cautious when you have find someone that says Christ and, Christ and, Christ and. No, it's not Christ and, it's Christ alone. And we remind ourselves of this. We understand this truth and this principle. But there's not only someone with false doctrine, but there's also saints to ain't, someone with false feelings. They believe a heinous sin that they've committed can actually cause them to lose their salvation. You see, sinner to saint is something that God does in us through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. There is only one thing you and I contributed to our salvation. Guess what it was? Sin. That's it. That's all you and I contributed to our salvation was our sin. You see, the Bible's clear. I I didn't go looking for God. God came looking for me. And here's the reason why. I was dead in my trespasses 
in sin. I was like a zombie walking, and my whole life was dedicated to the craving of my lust in sin. Uh, uh. That was the mantra of my life. Sin, sin, sin. Listen to what it says gloriously in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you hath he, oh, I love this word, quickened. That word quickened. Who were dread, dead in trespasses and sin. That word quickened means made alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. I am the nail. God is the hammer. Uh, uh. I'm a child of wrath. Look what it says in verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Wow, if it stopped right there, how sad that would be. No hope. But look at verse 4. Oh, it's getting good. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us. That's something to be excited about. God has gloriously saved me. You see, you can't lose your salvation. God loved you before that. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, very familiar. But God commendeth his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, some people get so wrapped up in their sin and they, they allow it to blind them. And as a result of this, they can't go forward. Listen, God knows you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. But let's get past it. Let's go forward. And let's not live in the past. Paul didn't live in the past. He got gloriously saved and went forward. Your salvation is based on what God has done for you, not on what you have done or what anyone else has done for you. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter. By the way, you're not surprising God that you're a sinner. Or, or they sin. No, he knows that. Shall we sin that grace may abound? Heaven forbid. We need to grow in the grace and knowledge of God, becoming more like Christ. But look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. To the inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, ooh, look at this, who are kept. That word kept is garrisoned in the original. By the power of God, through faith under salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. My friend, you don't have a hold of God. God has a hold of you. He's got a hold of you. Be careful of those that have corrupt communication. Be careful. So it's, it's secure from corrupt counselors. It's secure also from being inadequate. In verse 32, it talks about God giving. In verse 32, God spared not. In the original, it means kept not back. Abraham, we remember in chapter 22 of Genesis, offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice you remember the story God says get up take your son go to a place I will show you and sacrifice him can you imagine receiving that news oh and yet Abraham moved with faith got two of his servants got his son let's go we're going on a trip he'd been on this trip several times before the fire, the wood, the two servants, and his son going on this trip. He gets a certain, he goes a certain way, and then all of a sudden he says to the servants, hold on, my son and I are going to go a little further. And you remember what he says. Isaac says to his dad, Abraham, Dad, I see the wood. I see the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And do you remember what Abraham says to his son? God will provide a lamb. God will provide a a lamb. He takes his son, puts him on the altar, ties him up, a willing sacrifice, a beautiful picture of God and his son. Abraham takes his hand up, ready to sacrifice his son, and what happens? God stills his hand. Abraham, Abraham, you held nothing back from me. Abraham held nothing back from God, and God has held nothing back for you and for me. He gave 
everything. He gave his son. It says God delivered to surrender something or someone. Listen to what it says in Romans 4.25. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. You see, God freely gives us all things to give graciously, to give something as a sign of one benefit to goodwill towards someone else. This is all the benefit is freely given. Is the best package. Have you ever seen those packages? You get them, and then there's tin, and there's copper, there's bronze, silver, gold, gold one, gold two, gold three, gold four, platinum. And these different lists have all these benefits. And the tin's only like two of them, you know. You know, and then, then you get silver, you know, you get bronze, and it's like three. And then you get to XP, and the XP platinum is all the way, the length of the paper. It's got everything. You're like, wow, I want that one. But I can't afford it. I can't afford it. You see, God could afford it, and he delivered for you. And he delivered his son. And because he delivered his son, that's what That's why our salvation is secure. It's because it's adequate. It's not inadequate. It's adequate. It is secure from the corrupt counselors. It is secure from being inadequate. But it's also secure from the charge. And what am I speaking about the charge? The accusations. We see Satan is the accuser of the brethren. But we understand that even an individual like Job, remember the conversation God and Satan had about Job? God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job in chapter 1, verse 8? But you know, although Job was not perfect, he was a servant of God. And he had a genuine faith. And in Job chapter 42, verse 7 and 8, it says, Therefore, in verse 8, Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourself a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you and your folly, that you have not spoken of me and the things which is right, like my servant Job. Job had his accusers before him. He had his accuser, Satan. But God still called him a servant. Do you remember Peter? We have accusations before us. Peter, Jesus told Peter Peter, that Satan desired to sift Peter. But Jesus had prayed for him. Luke 22, 31, 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, violently shake you. But I have prayed for thee. That thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthened by the brethren. You see, God is the one that justifieth. It is the one that declares us righteous. In Isaiah 50, verse 8, it says, He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. You see, God is the one that justifieth. And it doesn't matter about fuzzy doctrine, although we stand for the truth. can't rob you of your salvation. And therefore, we see the accuser now. He comes, and we have an adequate salvation. Now the accuser comes, and we don't have to listen to his uh, accusing voice because Christ is in the position of authority. He's at the right hand of the throne of God. He is alive, which we just celebrated Easter Sunday, but also Christ is in the position of advocacy, the right hand, 1 John chapter 2, verses uh, 1 and 2, it talks about Jesus being our advocate. And it was predicted in Psalms chapter, one, uh, chapter 110, verse 1, The Lord said unto my, unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Hence it is called sitting on the right hand of power in Matthew 26, 24. And sitting on the right hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1, 3. That's the voice God's listening to, not to the accuser. So it is secure from the corrupt counselors. It is secure from being inadequate. It is secure from the charge. But it's also secure from circumstances. It is proven that God cannot fail us, but the question becomes, can we fail God? God permits trials in our lives for growth, to learn to be conquerors through him. 
Oh, my friend, have you stepped into a battle? I hope you haven't. I hope everything's sunshine and rainbows for you. But please, when you are getting ready to battle, remember this is not how we stand. We don't stand in our own righteousness, in our own uh, selfishness, in our own pride. Here's what we do. We stand with Christ before us. We stand putting him before us. And that's how we'll stand. That's how we'll fight. Not in our own strength, in putting Christ first. And so we see circumstances will come and go, height, depth, left, right, principalities, nations come, policies, laws are made in favor or against. But God empowers us in our day-to-day life. Learn that nothing can come between You and God, no condemnation, no separation. He teaches a simple truth to little children, and that is the truth. God will never leave you nor forsake you, and that is God will never leave you. It's a biblical truth. He'll never leave you no matter what situation you face. In closing, let me give you the, the story of George Matherson. It's a young man who was blind at an early age, and he wrote and composed an incredible hymn. And the name of the hymn is, Oh, Love That Will Not Let Me Go. In the book by Wearsby called Living with the Giants, Matherson said of the hymn, It came to me spontaneously, without conscious effort, and I have never been able to gain Once more, the same fervor in verse that is in that hymn. He admitted a crisis had been involved, but he did not say what it was. The hymn was the fruit of that crisis. The lyrics say, O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths it flows. My richer, fuller be, O light that flowest all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. My heart restores its borrowed ray that in thy sunshine glow its day. May brighter, fairer be. O joy, you seek me through the pain. I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not in vain. Then morn shall tearless be. My friend, your salvation is safe and secure. You cannot lose it. And so therefore, it is safe and secure. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity just to to be able to look through it. Father, in an audience like this, who knows what we stand in the need of, but God, we come to you humbly. And we pray that maybe there's someone here today that they, like Peter, are being sifted. They are being shaken. And, Father, they have doubts of their salvation, and they need to get those doubts taken care of. Maybe there's someone here today that is not saved and has never trusted Jesus as their Savior. And, God, you are giving them the gift of faith, and they are drawing themselves unto you, and they, and they see that gift of faith, and they would like to receive Christ as their Savior. With every head bowed and all eyes closed, maybe there's someone here today or tonight that has never received Christ as their Savior but would like to do that with an up straight, up raised hand. My friend, I would never embarrass you. But maybe there's someone here tonight that has never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they'd like to do so. They say, I yield, I yield, like Paul. Or maybe like that Philippian jailer, they ask that question, what must I do to be saved? Is there anyone here that would like to trust Jesus as their Savior? And the second invitation is maybe to someone out there that is going through a difficult time in their faith. They don't have the joy of their salvation, and they so desperately need it. God, would you remind them of these basic truths that their salvation is safe and secure because it's not based in who they are it's based in who you are and Father we'll be sure to give you all the honor and glory for this special truth in your word
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a pleasure.